Алло, здравствуйте, коллеги. Проверка связи и видео. Слышно ли меня? Видно ли меня? Трансляцию. Через пять минут мы начнем. Напоминаю, что наш симпозиум российско-японский будет проходить на английском языке, рабочем языке английском. Ну и мы рады приветствовать всех тех, кто к нам присоединился. Uh, hello to the Professor Takahashi. I'm very, yeah. glad, I'm very glad to see you here. Uh, but, uh, what about uh, the uh, connection of Dr. Kinoshita? I have no seeing here. Ah, uh, really? Uh, his camera is off. Hmm. Uh, Kinoshita Sensei. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> We're starting <laughs> soon. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we uh, starting the satellite uh, Russian uh, Japan uh, satellite uh, symposium, uh, which dedicated the glioma, uh, biological and um, genetic of uh, glioma. Uh, and first of all, on behalf of the, our um, University of Paul of Saint Petersburg Medical. State Medical University, and from um, behalf of my, my own, uh, I want to welcome to all, all participants uh, of this symposium, and I hope that uh, this uh, conference uh, will be very useful and very fruitful, because uh, the uh, all scientific uh, collaboration is uh, not mathematic sum of the knowledge. I'm very sure that is the amplification of this one. <laughs> uh, and uh, first of all, I would like to welcome uh, welcome to uh, prof my friend and my colleague, uh, Professor Takahashi, uh, say a couple words uh, as a welcome uh, from uh, Kanazawa University. Uh, please check in. Okay, thank you, Mikai. So uh, on behalf of our organizer committee members for this session, I'd like to give some greetings. I'm Jack Takahashi, Cancer Research Institute, Canada University, Japan, and the Canada University, and the Pablo Forest uh, St. Petersburg Medical University have been actively collaborating to promote our uh, exchanges in medical sciences and education in uh, probably these four years. And uh, today, uh, the DNA Day 2021 kindly allowed us to dedicate a session organized by both University. So two speakers from Russia and the other two from Japan will be presenting our cutting edge information on clinical and genetic aspects of cerebral tumors. Okay, now uh, I'd like to start the sessions. Okay, my, my guy. Hmm. Okay. So uh, let me introduce the first speaker. So uh, she's uh, uh, Dr. Ortea Asan Patrolia. Uh, she's working at Keio University, Tokyo, Japan. And uh, her uh, title is uh, Warburg Effect and Metabolic Plasticity in Brain Tumor Stem Cells. So Ortea Sensei, uh, Thank you, Professor Takahashi for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor and a great pleasure to be here today. And I like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present our work. The topic of my talk, as you can see, will be the Warburg effect and metabolic plasticity in brain tumor stem cells, specifically in glioma stem cells. First, I will briefly touch on why we are studying the metabolism of malignant gliomas and then present our results showing that actually not all glioma cells exhibit the Warburg effect and that depleting glucose might not be necessarily beneficial. Next slide, please. So one of the reasons that malignant gliomas and especially glioblastomas recur is the existence of a subset of cells that evade surgery, chemo and radiotherapy. As you know, research in recent years has shown that these cells, called glioma stem cells, or GSCs, have a high DNA damage repair ability, a high drug exclusion ability, a high invasion ability, and can generate enough cells to build new tumors. The main common feature for all these characteristics 
is thus that they all require lots of energy. We therefore hypothesized that turning off the energy supply would help stop or maybe even exterminate the GSCs. So, uh, next slide, please. So we first looked at what the literature tells us and we found that glioblastomas as a mass seem to have high glucose consumption and exhibit a Warburg effect, as you can see in the right bottom corner. Next slide, please. However, when we looked only at stem cells, the reports were quite contradictory. Some groups showed that stem cells rely more on oxidative phosphorylation than differentiated tumor cells. Other groups showed that they can be targeted by glycolytic inhibitors. Yet other reports show that the metabolism differs by genetic characteristics. However, each of these reports uses a different model and different techniques to investigate. So it is quite difficult to integrate these results. Next, please. It was very confusing because if we want metabolic targeting to be effective, it needs to affect all the GSCs at all time. So we decided to investigate the metabolism in a unified, unified experimental system. Next, please. We use our model of induced glioma stem cells. We start with isolating neural stem cells from the subventricular zone cells from INC4A ARF knockout mice. After a brief period of culture, we transduce the neural stem cells with an oncogenic form of HRAS and fluorescent reporters such as DS-RED. The cells transform and become glioma-initiating cells. These glioma-initiating cells, when implanted into the forebrain of Y-type mice, form tumors very similar to glioblastomas. We then extract the tumors, sort for the fluorescent reporter, and continue stem cell culture to enrich for, this time, glioma stem cells. Next, please. When implanted into the mouse forebrain, our cells form aggressive tumors with a penetrance of 100%. As you can see in the macroscopic pictures, the tumors show macroscopic hemorrhage and necrosis, they enhance on MRI, and they are lethal within one month. Next, please. So uh, this, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, our first question was whether all isogenic GICs have the same metabolism. To investigate that, we plated one GIC in individual wells in 96 well plates, and we found that about 70% of the cells form spheres, suggesting they had stem-like properties. As you can see from the different sphere sizes, all clones had slightly different growth rates. Interestingly, however, even for spheres with the same size, the color of the media was either yellow, suggesting acidic media, or pink, suggesting basic media. To further investigate the differences between such clones, we chose representative clones and called the ones which turned the media yellow, clone A, as in acidic, and the pink ones, clone B, as in basic. Next, please. When we investigated the lactate production of the clones, as well as the neural stem cells, we found that, as shown on the left graph, the production was very low in neural stem cells and highest in the acidic clones, the red graph. Consistent with these results, glucose consumption was highest in the acidic clone. If you look on the right graph again, the red bar is the highest. So this cells called GSCA had the highest lactate production and the highest glucose consumption. Next, please. We next quantified the overall metabolism of these cells with the extracellular acidification rate on the x-axis, which is a proxy for glycolytic function, and oxygen consumption rate on the y-axis, which is a proxy for mitochondrial function. Again, NSCs had the lowest metabolism and both the bulk population of the GICs, as well as the two clones, 
had a markedly higher metabolic activity. Clone A had a higher glycolytic function, and clone B had a higher mitochondrial function. Next, please. Interestingly, when implanted into the mouse forebrain, all clones formed very similar tumors. As you can see from the pathology slides, they could not be distinguished on pathological analysis. Either by growth, they had similar KI67 percentages, or by vascularization. Next slide, please. However, when isolated, when we isolated GSCs from each tumor, we found that the stem cells also, the, the ones derived from the clone A tumors, they had again higher glucose consumption and lactate production. If you look at the red bars and the red graphs while the GSCs from the tumors initiated by the mitochondrial type GICs, the blue ones, had a higher oxygen consumption and a higher ATP content, suggesting that the GSC population also shows metabolic heterogeneity. This slide also has animation, so yes. Can you please show the animation to the end? Yes, thank you. Okay, so, the type A cells are more glycolytic and the type B cells are more mitochondrial. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. The same tendency was confirmed at protein level, where glycolytic enzymes are the highest in GSCA and the lowest in neural stem cells. If you look at this, the results of this Western blot like a sort of barcode, you can see that hexokinase 2, PKM2, PDK1, LDH, they are all highest in the GSCA, uh, lower in GSCB, and the lowest in NSCs. Next slide, please. The difference in metabolic phenotype was also detected at the transcriptome level, where microarray analysis followed by GSCA showed that GSCA were enriched in genes related to glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, while GSCB were enriched in genes related to oxidative phosphorylation and amino acid metabolism. Next, please. To briefly summarize, we thus found that not all the glioma stem cells, and therefore by extension, not all the glioma cells exhibit the Warburg effect. They can either use glycolysis or they can use oxidative phosphorylation. Next, please. As I mentioned earlier, in order for metabolic targeting to be effective, it should affect all the glioma stem cells at any time. We already found that there are two types of metabolism in the basal state. Next, we asked what happens when we reduce oxygen or glucose. Thank you. Next, please. First, we reduced oxygen. As you know, GBMs are characterized by hypoxic lesions formed either by limited perfusion, which can lead to acute hypoxia, shown on the right in this figure, or by limited diffusion, which leads to chronic hypoxia. Next, please. Thank you. We therefore first interrogated acute hypoxia. We exposed the cells to 1% oxygen and measured their lactate production. Neural stem cells produced the lowest lactate and glycolytic GSCs produced the highest lactate. However, these two cells were not affected by hypoxia. In contrast, the oxidative GSCB cells in hypoxia, they started to produce significantly more lactate, suggesting a switch to glycolysis. Next, please. To test the effect of chronic hypoxia, we divided our cells in three groups. One was kept in normoxia, one was moved to hypoxia for eight days, and one group to hypoxia for four days, and then back to normoxia for four days. When we measured the lactate production, we found that, again, glycolytic GSCs were not affected. As you can see, the red bars are all fairly equal. In contrast, oxidative GSCBs 
increased their lactate production and then decreased it again when brought back to normoxia. This suggests that GSCB switched to glycolysis in hypoxia and then returned to oxfos in normoxia. Next, please. Indeed, the expression of glycolytic enzymes, the ones I have shown you before, these are shown on the left again, it increases in hypoxia and then returns to original levels in normoxia. In contrast, the expression of some of the mitochondrial complexes decreases in hypoxia and then returns. These changes are especially pronounced in the mitochondrial type GSCs and represent an adaptation to the conditions of the myocardial environment. Next, please. Yes, can you please run the whole animation? Yes. Yes, thank you, that's okay. Okay, thank you. So we therefore examined the changes in intracellular metabolite levels more closely. PCA analysis of metabolome results show that the two types of GSCs not only separate along the two principal components with amino acids and PPP intermediates as loading factors, but importantly, that the mitochondrial GSCs, when exposed to hypoxia, adapts by markedly switching to a more glycolytic phenotype and back. Next slide, please. So to summarize the second point, we found that oxidative GSCs adapt to hypoxia by reversibly switching to glycolysis. Next, please. Next, we looked at the result of depleting glucose. Next, please. Several reports have shown that many malignant tumors, such as lung tumors and pancreatic cancer, when deprived of glucose, use alternative substrates. Now, the brain is abundant in many other possible substrates, such as glutamate or lactic acid. We are currently looking at all these possibilities, but today I would like you to show I would like to show you our latest data, which, which is on uh, the use of lactate. Next, please. So first, we reduced the glucose to 1% of our normal culture conditions, which is uh, 0.175 millimolar glucose. And we found that this concentration of glucose allow the GSCs to survive, but not to proliferate. We then added different concentrations of lactate and quantified the size of the spheres formed by our cells. Next slide, please. As you can see on the top panel in the left uh, figure, the glycolytic GSCAs were not able to grow under these conditions. The sphere size is constant. In contrast, the size of the spheres formed by the oxidative GSB increased with the concentration of lactate, suggesting these cells were using lactate to grow. Indeed, GSCA had a higher expression of MCT4, which is the monocarboxylate transporter used to export lactate, and of LDHA, which is the enzyme converting pyruvate to lactate for export. In contrast, GSCB cells had more transporters that import lactate, such as MCT2, and more enzyme that switch lactate to pyruvate, such as LDHB. Next, please. Interestingly, GSCB could also use acetate for growth, and this has already been reported that gliomas can use acetate in place of glucose. However, in our cells, interestingly, they could not use pyruvate, which is very strange because pyruvate is also imported into the cells through the same transporters as lactate. Other substrates such as TCA substrates were not useful. They could not be used as alternate substrates. Next slide, please. 
Furthermore, also very interestingly, we found that GSCB can use lactate only in the presence of oxygen, but not in hypoxia. Next slide, please. So when we think about the tumor, in which case would glucose be low, but oxygen enough? Well, one place could be the leading edge of the tumor, because we already know that normal astrocytes consume glucose. So the competition for glucose might be higher in this place than the one for oxygen. A second scenario is when we voluntarily decrease glucose supply on purpose, for instance, through ketogenic diet. Next slide, please. So we next asked how the lactate is actually used to support proliferation. We found that lactate increased oxygen consumption rate, as shown on the left. Again, the purple bar is the group with only very little glucose, and the red bar is the group with little glucose and supplemented with lactate. So as you can see in all these graphs, the oxygen consumption rate is increased by lactate, and then ATP is also increased by lactate, GTP is increased by lactate, adenylate charge, guanylate charge, which means the energy charge of the cells are increased by lactate. Next slide, please. When we examine the intracellular metabolites by capillary electrophoresis coupled with mass spectrometry, we found that TCA cycle intermediates such as citric acid, fumaric acid, and malic acid were also increased, suggesting an increase in oxidative phosphorylation. Next slide, please. Interestingly, lactate also increased intracellular glutathione, the NADPH and NADP reserves, which all act to reduce oxidative stress. Indeed, when we quantified intracellular reactive oxygen species by cell rocks, the levels were lower in the lactate-treating cells. So lactate affects not only the energy of the cells, but also the redox status of the cells. Next, please. And lastly, in this part, I would like to show you another interesting finding, which was that the replenishment of choline and glycerol 3P, which together with the metabolic set enrichment analysis results on the left, they show that maybe lactate can rescue lipid synthesis. Next slide, please. So what does this actually mean? When we implanted the GSCs treated with lactate, either subcutaneously or intracranially, as you can see, they formed much more aggressive tumors in both settings. Next slide, please. The last short summary, GSCs can also adapt to depletion of glucose by using alternate substrates such as lactate. Next slide, please. So what does that mean in terms of treatment? We added metabolic inhibitors to our cells. Next slide, please. As expected, if you look at the very top panel, glycolytic inhibitor 2DG was highly effective against glycolytic GSCs. In contrast, it was less effective against oxidative GSCs. Oxfos inhibitor oligomycin and fenformin were effective against GSCB. You can also see it in the sphere size and in the graphs where the sphere size has been quantified. The lower the bar on the graph, the more cells have been killed or the more proliferation has been inhibited. So this is a little like expected, and we were very glad to see that inhibiting glycolysis can actually reduce a lot of the GSCs. However, I would like to point out that GSCBs, if you look at the graphs, they never reached complete extermination. The blue line, it never reaches the axis. 
And we think that this is because, as I have shown, they adapt very easily to metabolic inhibition, either by switching to glycolysis in hypoxia or by using different substrates. This is why these cells are very difficult to kill by metabolic targeting. Next slide, please. Yes, this is just a little proof of what I have told you. If we look at the um, oxygen consumption, it goes down after oligomycin treatment in the mitochondrial oxidative GSCs. However, the lactate flux as seen by the ECAR coefficient goes up. So after OXFOS inhibitors, the oxidative GSCs exhibit a metabolic compensation. And this is probably the reason why they are very difficult to kill. Next slide, please. And I have thus reached my conclusion and I would like to summarize again saying that GSCs can use both glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation and they have metabolic plasticity, that the tumor microenvironment is a major determinant of their metabolism, and that single pathway targeting is probably not sufficient to kill these cells. Therefore, we think that combination therapies are necessary to overcome metabolic plasticity. And I do not mean combination of two metabolic targeting because that does not work. It has already been tried. Probably combination of a metabolic inhibitor with other types of therapy such as radiation or uh, signal pathway inhibitors. And I would like to end here with the acknowledgements. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Olga Sensei. So uh, very beautiful work. Thank you uh, very much for sharing this information with us. So uh, uh, we have five minutes uh, to take questions from audience. Uh, if, if, I, yep. if possible, one question. Um, uh, thank you very much for your report. But um, what do you th uh, how do you think uh, is uh, uh, the both uh, metabolic uh, metabolic uh, pathway as able uh, available is only one uh, cells or um, there are uh, some uh, uh, sub uh, subgroup uh, uh, cells glioma cells uh, can using this uh, different type of the metabolism. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think that, as you say, there are some subgroups which can use it. And uh, these subgroups are not necessarily stable, but uh, sometimes many subgroups exist and then sometimes only a few subgroups exist. So this may, might be different from tumor to tumor. It might be different from patient to patient, but as a possibility, I think there are multiple subtypes in terms of metabolism. Okay, because it's very important for the treatment of glucose. Yes. glucose. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Any other question? So I have a question. So uh, glioma cells uh, can be divided to glycolytic mitochondria. And the glycolytic cells produce lots of lactate and the uh, mitochondrial cells make use of it. So if so, uh, when we you mix uh, the, uh, these cells in uh, like sphere, say, so they benefit to each other? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think that is a very important point because if you look at the results I have shown today, if the mm -hmm. glycolytic cell produce lactate and the oxidative cells can use that, that lactate, there is mm -hmm. definitely a benefit towards mm -hmm. each other. And there is a metabolic symbiosis, which yeah. helps both cells proliferate. Mm -hmm. And that would make treatment, again, very difficult. Yeah, okay. Yes. Any other question? Uh, I have many questions, right? Uh, actually, lactate uh, may be used by, uh, uh, by uh, immune cells as well. Mm. Yes. So what, what's your uh, opinion on the inter uh, uh, interaction with uh, immune cells in terms of these uh, heterogeneity and agrima cells. Yes, I, I think there are reports 
already in other tumors, other than brain tumors, that immune cells also uh, can produce, can actually use lactate, I think. But uh, th this will be very important to investigate because again, the immune cells will definitely be a part of the symbiosis probably. So we think of them as attacking glioblastoma cells, but maybe due to their metabolic characteristics, they mm -hmm. will actually be used by the glioma cells. So that would be again, very bad okay. for the course of, for the yeah. clinical course. And my uh, final question is what are determinant of glycolytic on mitochondria? Because your uh, 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 mitochondria cells uh, adapt to glycolytic uh, when hypoxia induced. Yeah. So I guess uh, in glycolytic cells, inference of HIF or MIG might be stronger in mitochondria cells. And what, what's your finding on it? <laughs> So uh, in our two types of cells, if we look at the glycolytic cells, they never uh, switch to any other state. They can only oh. use glycolysis mm -hmm. and they die if we inhibit glycolysis. So uh, as you said, they have a high expression of HIF and MIC and we think they, that these, uh, these cells are genetically determined. Genetically. However, mm -hmm. the, the GSCB, they can switch very quickly, maybe three hours, they switch to glycolysis and then they switch back. So these cannot be genetically determined. These are probably epigenetically regulated. Okay. So uh, we have not found yet a single major determinant, but we think that the environment is very important in switching them through very many different factors. Thank you. Uh, any other question from our uh, audience? You can make question. Uh, any? Okay. If no more, uh, thank you very much, Odia Sensei. Yeah. Thank you so very I much. To other second speaker. Thank you. Thank you. So that's our second speaker is uh, our uh, Dr. Mikhail uh, uh, Zalaiski. And uh, his title uh, for this session is Genetic Mechanism of Metabolic Pathway Reprogramming uh, in Gliomas. So Mikhail, please start. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh no. Okay. Hello again. Uh, I'm very glad to introduce uh, the uh, preliminary data of our pilot uh, study, uh, which uh, 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 which reflected our. Mikhail Igorich, you have microphone выключен, и не видно презентацию. Включите микрофон, пожалуйста. Звук. Да, так, все. слышно меня? Да, да, да. да. И теперь а... еще у вас презентация не запущена. А, я запустил демонстрацию экрана. Это еще да. один. Да, 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 да. Имейте в виду, что презентации пока нет. Угу. Так, сейчас, секунду. Сейчас я. Как мне вернуться? Отмените и снова зайдите. Сейчас. Угу. Так, вот вижу, вижу, вижу. Так, демонстрация экрана. Да. Так. Теперь и видно? С... Да, так свой... вот, теперь видно, да, все, порядок. Угу. И слышно, и видно, да? Угу. Да, да, все хорошо. Так, вот так нормально, да? Да, отлично. Все, спасибо всем. Um, uh, good morning again. Uh, uh, I'm very uh, glad to show uh, and present uh, our uh, preliminary data, uh, the pilot um, investigation, pilot study uh, concerning the um, uh, investigation of co-expression uh, gene uh, somatic and uh, gene of microRNA in glioma uh, 
in glioma in connection of the reprogramming uh, pathway of metabolism. Uh, the Warburg uh, effect uh, here, here you can see uh, in the early the 1920s, Warburg published experimental data on enhancing uh, conversion of glucose of 2 pyruvate following the lactate formation. Uh, even the presence of abundance of oxygen, he attributed his metabolic uh, trait to a respiratory injury and considering this as a universal metabolism alternative on carcinogenesis here. You can see the normal cells, the both uh, pathway of the metabolism of glucose and um, uh, oxidation um, uh, oxidation pathway and in cancer cells we have the other situation. Uh, the uh, cancer cell uh, glucose metabolism um, give the only two um, the two molecules of, of uh, ATP and uh, comparing the normal cells, uh, uh, the glucose metabolism in cancer cell, we have a very big uh, mm, uh, velocity and activity. Uh, object of our study is a glioma. Uh, glioma accounts as a 27 percent of all uh, brain tumor and 80 percent of malignant tumor. Glioma is, is a, a, a heterogenic disease with multiple uh, subtypes. And uh, most uh, common glioma histology is a very uh, poor outcome. Survival here you can see it's very poor prognosis and the different type of the glioma. Here you can see uh, the uh, the last classification uh, of uh, WHO, uh, where I have seen the all type of glioma. The Warburg effect is a part of the glioma. Glioma uh, bio, uh, bio energetic. You can see the uh, glucose metabolism is closely connected with the pentose phosphate uh, pathway, the oxidation uh, metabolism, ketolysis, and so on. Much more genes um, participate uh, the both uh, the both strategy of the um, of the cells. Uh, uh, I mean. Uh, uh, in other hand, uh, these genes control the uh, metabolism of glucose, and on the other hand, um, uh, these genes control the uh, thumb pathway or the cancerogenesis. Uh, here you can see the, uh, the some genes uh, control the oxidative pentose, uh, uh, phosphorylation, um, uh, energetic glucose, and control the disabled the apoptosis. Uh, proliferation and so on. Because, um, some genes uh, play a very uh, big role in the control of the some uh, metabolism. For example, uh, gene uh, P53 uh, um, uh, controls the self-regulation, uh, growth um, control, and other glycolytic protein and oxidation metabolism. The aim of our study is a co-expression profiles of genes that control various uh, metabolic pathway and microRNA gene in glioma uh, tumor uh, tissue and tissue of the peripheral region. Yeah, 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 and this slide, you can see a list uh, gene with we uh, searching. For example, the three gene PP53, TDF beta, NF kappa beta, and uh, TNF. Uh, control is the glucose uh, metabolism. Uh, yet E2F3, KLF6, uh, yet ETF1 uh, as a transcription factor, uh, metabolic stress. Uh, Cooper factor 12 uh, uh, control is the fat metabolism. Uh, BCL2 mitochondrial uh, metabolism. MMP9 uh, not, uh, is not directly, it's indirectly control is the energetic metabolism through the activation of angiogenesis. And epidermal growth factor receptor is controlled as the one of the way of the signaling pathway. The main uh, regulators of the some genes uh, is uh, as a microRNA. In our investigation, we uh, use the, the system 
uh, for the uh, microRNA 15, 16, 21, uh, 128, 210, and 342. Here you can see the function of this microRNA in the uh, glioma uh, tumor progression. You can see the, uh, the microRNA 21 in 210 is the oncogen, the other uh, is a tumor suppressor uh, microRNA. The operating material, we uh, investigate the um, two type of the tissue, the focus tissue from the, um, uh, from the central of the um, tumor and peripheral region, it's a normal, um, a normal uh, brain um, tissue, uh, which place it close it the uh, tumor. After the bioinformatic uh, analysis, we can see um, uh, we can see that uh, this microRNA have a binding size uh, with uh, five uh, from eleven uh, investigated genes, but uh, six genes have no the binding size of this uh, investigated the microRNA. Uh, here you can see the result of our um, uh, our investigation. If uh, you can see that um, uh, KLF12 uh, uh, have a very uh, significant high uh, expression in a focus uh, of the tumor, but uh, comparing the perifocal um, focus, the two uh, on Comir uh, 210 and 21, have the significantly uh, higher expression in focus, the same as the KLF12. The other uh, microRNA have no significant difference. And here we postulate the uh, co-expression, the micro, uh, microRNA21 and 210 have a positive co-expression with KLF12. The other gene, E2F3, uh, the transcription factor, uh, have the same the situation uh, as a KLF12, uh, and uh, focus uh, uh, focus of tumor uh, have a very high uh, um, expression, significantly higher than uh, perifocal um, uh, perifocal tissue, but microRNA, which have a binding siding with this um, uh, mRNA to E2F3, F, uh, F3 have a uh, different um, uh, different situation. For example, the microRNA 15 and 120, uh, 128 have a reverse situation because in perifocal tissue have uh, have a very uh, big um, expression comparing the focus. But three other micro, uh, microRNA 21, uh, 16, and 210 have um, in uh, in focus have a significantly uh, very, was a high, um, high expression in focus comparing the peripheral um, uh, peripheral tissue. Here we, we postulated the uh, three microRNA have a positive co-expression and two uh, have a um, reverse situation. A GFR. Um, in uh, focus of the uh, tumor has a very high, uh, significantly high expression, and uh, one uh, of the um, microRNA 121 have, which uh, have a, a binding siting in this gene, have a, a, has a reverse situation because in the peripheral tissue have a very big um, expression comparing the tumor. Uh, here we postulate the negative co-expression situation. The KLF6 um, uh, have no uh, significant difference uh, in uh, focus and peripheral um, and peripheral tissue, uh, but uh, have only tendention tendention for the um, evaluation um, expression in peripheral um, uh, perifocal uh, tissue comparing the tumor. But um, um, the same situation was in the micro microRNA. For example, the uh, 15 uh, micro uh, microRNA 15 has no uh, significant difference uh, in this situation. 
but uh, macroRNA 21 and 342 have a significant um, uh, was a significant uh, um, uh, was higher in focus of the tumor. Here you can see the um, uh, tendency of co-expression. Uh, BCL2 uh, was um, have a very high expression in perifocal comparing the, uh, the uh, tumor tissue and the microRNA has a uh, different situation. Uh, the, the 15, um, uh, 15 uh, was uh, higher in perifocal and uh, 16 uh, more, was more high in focus. Uh, other gene which have no uh, which had no um, site of binding with microRNA has a, 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 a different situation. For example, the gene P53 uh, uh, MMP9 and TGF beta uh, show the uh, evaluated expression inside the focus uh, uh, focus comparing the uh, perifocal tissue. But uh, for the uh, tumor P, uh, tumor suppression uh, gene P53, this um, situation was not significant. And uh, the NF kappa beta, EF, uh, E2F1, and TNF uh, has a uh, reverse situation. Uh, the expression of the perifocal uh, tissue was uh, higher than. Uh, the uh, then uh, focus of the um, uh, of the tumor, but for the NF kappa beta, this uh, difference was not significantly. Uh, uh, here you can uh, you can see the uh, fo uh, rate activation and focus and perifocal uh, perifocal uh, tissue. Um, uh, comparing the uh, level of the uh, expression. If you can see that um, uh, in, the, um, in the focus was uh, much more higher expression was uh, a color uh, 12, excuse me, uh -huh. uh, 12, uh, which uh, controls the fat metabolism, but uh, in the perifocal uh, activating the glucosa, uh, TNF, uh, TNF is a glucosa metabolism. And then uh, the other genes um, show the uh, lower, um, uh, lower uh, level of the uh, significantly. Summary, first, a metabolic pathway in the tumor and peripheral areas are controlled by uh, various genetic uh, system. The second uh, gen involved in activation of adipose KLF12 and energetic metabolism MMP9 uh, are predominantly expression in tumor tissue. The third, uh, in the peripheral uh, region, genes which uh, that control the glucose metabolism TNF and mitochondrial metabolism BCL2 and metabolism of stress, uh, metabolic stress gene E2F1 are predominantly, predominantly expressed. And um, uh, fourth uh, summary, TAP53 and F kappa beta gene do not differ in uh, expression in tumor and perifocal uh, region. The microRNK expression level um, uh, was uh, shown on this slide. You can see that in the focus of the gene uh, um, um, uh, much more uh, was was much more expressed in micro uh, micro RNA sixteen uh, twenty one uh, may, maybe lower to uh, two hundred and ten and three hundred uh, and forty two but in perifocal um, tissue uh, pre um, predisposition uh, was uh, the micro RNA one hundred twenty eight and fifteen. Here you can see the uh, coex uh, expression profile of gene, uh, which virus which controlled uh, the virus metabolic pathway in microRNA genes. You can see the uh, one um, uh, one the one uh, microRNA uh, can uh, has a, uh, as a positive coexpression uh, and uh, also a, and a negative expression. Uh, with uh, somatic uh, gene which controls metabolic uh, process. The summary two, 
The metabolic pathway and the tumor and perifocal areas are controlled by various epigenetic system. In glial tumorous tissue, the expression of microRNA 1621 to 110 and 342 predominates. And the perifocal region, the expression of microRNA um, uh, 128 and 15 is increased. Uh, there is a clear uh, the relation uh, shift uh, uh, between the expression of metabolic gene and macro-RNA. The nature of this connection of, uh, in um, our fuser study. And uh, turn back to the, um, uh, turn back to the uh, Warburg effect. Um, this is a crucial, uh, crucial questions. Uh, what is the, uh, what is the sequence of the cancerogenesis? Uh, the cancerogenesis uh, provides aerobic glucose or reverse situation. What's consequences and what causes? Uh, this is a very, very big question from uh, Otto Hendrik Warburg. Thank you for attention. Uh, I want to introduce our current uh, team as um, a team for the power of uh, uh, St. Petersburg, uh, Petersburg State Medical University and Human Brain Institute of Bechterev um, uh, um, Academy of Science. Thank you for attention, please, questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mika. Yeah. So, uh, question, please. One moment. One okay, moment. our first, our first question. So, uh, you look at four car and the four car uh, in the glioma tissues. And they focus uh, for uh, oncomere, the uh, highly expressed. And uh, probably you look at the, like a prognosis or a stage of patient. And uh, which, actually, which mere most uh, significantly correlate with uh, like a uh, tumor phenotype or aggressive phenotype? Um, um, uh, uh, I'm not ready uh, completely um, uh, formulate the answer of your question because it's a preliminary data and uh, we uh, search the patient with um, uh, the adequate level of aggressivity now. Mm -hmm. But uh, the other step, of course, we, uh, we uh, plan is using the uh, different um, uh, level of expression in different the type of the glioma of uh, of course and um, a relationship is prognosis and effectivity of pre of treatment uh, of course is the next step of our investigation okay mm. and you also are focused on the uh, perifocus uh, in the you mean the areas just uh, uh, around the tumors and the probably you think tumor and this tissue may be interacting with each other. And uh, you are proposing MIA 1, 2, 8, and 15 are important in this cell, or perifocal region is totally normal? Uh, excuse me, um, may maybe uh, um, re uh, repeat. Yeah. So. Uh, you uh, demonstrated two mirrors are uh, uh, highly expressed in perifocal. Mm -hmm. mm. In the uh, perifocal region means uh, the tissue remote from tumor or just surrounding the tumor. Uh, 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 of course, <laughs> this question, not for me, but for the surgical, um, uh, ah. <laughs> uh, surgical um, uh, physician. Um, there are the, um, uh, there are the clinical uh, criteria for the resection of the tumor, but uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't know completely uh, what is the, uh, what is the science of the peripheral or t Oh, ah, okay. It's, it's not for yeah, me. you. you you, you don't do surgery, yes. I, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a question, Professor Zalaski. Yeah, please. Mm. Ah, hi, Professor Zalaski. Yeah, yeah. This is Professor Nakada at the Department of Neurosurgery in Kanazawa University. Uh, you show that the many molecules and their microRNAs 
which are possible to be targets for glioblastoma, right? So um, my question is very similar with uh, Professor Takahashi's one, but uh, which one do you think most promising one as a target for glioblastoma? Uh, target, uh, I, I mean, the, for the treatment or a diagnostic? Yes, yes. Uh, treatment. Ah, treatment. Mm, uh, yeah, uh, in literature we have uh, the little bit uh, uh, paper um, which uh, uh, using the uh, anti-mir, uh, anti-mir, uh, anti-oncomir preparate, uh, for example, for for the 21 uh, microRNA. Uh, but uh, um, I. Uh, I'm not feel that uh, it's very effective. Um, effective because uh, the, um, the each uh, microRNA has a, for example, uh, microRNA 21 has a uh, three uh, thousand genes which uh, which which control. But uh, how to um, we we don't know the uh, precise mechanism for the uh, relation uh, be between microRNA and um, uh, and gene and so I think it's uh, today it's, uh, it's too early uh, talk about the effectivity of anti microRNA treatment. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, you are going to focus on specific microRNA as a target, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Thanks for your nice lecture. Yeah. Any other question from audience? Okay, if no, uh, 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 yeah, thank you very much, Mikhail. Okay, thanks. Mm. Okay, then, then we move to the next session. And the number three, number four are topics from clinics and uh, probably are di more diagnostic. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Masashi Kinoshita from Kanazi University, our neurosurgery department. And his title, uh, title for this session is Awake Surgery for Gliomas with Preservation of Higher Brain Functions and Challenge and Contribution. So Dr. Kinoshita, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Takahashi. Uh, it's my pleasure to participate in this uh, wonderful international symposium as a speaker. Uh, I'm, I'm Masashi Kinoshita from Kanada University, Japan. And firstly, I uh, have to mention that my content is different from other expert lectures and far, far from and genetic researches, but I hope uh, uh, I hope you, you can enjoy half an hour. Okay. Uh, the theme of this symposium glioma is a challenging brain tumor, and the first goal for us, uh, neurosurgeon, is maximal and safe surgical resection. Uh, today. I'd like to talk about glioma from a perspective of neurosurgery. Uh, before the introduction, you may have a question that, uh, is it possible to identify and preserve higher brain functions during surgery in, co in awake condition? And the answer is yes, but of course not all of them. Um, my presentation consists of two parts. Section one is how to approach to the cerebral glioma surrounded by functional brain tissues. I'd like to show our original and unique surgical technique. And in section two, I'll mention our clinical researches and the, the results in the fields of neuro-oncology and neurofunctional science. Okay, I'd like to start with part one, surgical strategy. Uh, glioma is one of the primary brain neoplasm, which include various WHO grades with characters of uh, invasion and malignant transformation. One of the purpose of the treatment is 
to reduce the tumor and uh, the number of gliomas and to prevent the upgrade. In the treatment of cerebral glioma, the most important aim is to confirm the diagnosis by tissue biopsy uh, for histopathological and genetic molecular examinations. Furthermore, maximal and safe, re safe rejection of the tumor uh, is a gold standard strategy for all grade gliomas. For us neurosurgeon, uh, ultimately, uh, it is a goal to improve not only survival outcome, uh, but also preserve higher brain functions against glioma. The, the oncofunctional balance is important point of view. Uh, in order to identify higher brain functional networks, we have been working on stepwise researches about these themes uh, from 2010 uh, using surgical techniques of awake brain mapping regarding basic and high level brain functions. In the next section, I'm going to show how to perform awake surgery and functional mapping. For the goal of maximal tumor rejection with functional preservation, uh, it is important to identify the cortical functional areas and subcortical white matter networks, uh, which can be visualized by preoperative diffusion tensor imaging. Direct electrical stimulation uh, uh, is a gold standard technique uh, to detect the pathway and decide the rejection boundary. And then, it can contribute to the enlarged and reliable and removal of the tumor. We use a bio, uh, bipolar probe uh, in biphasic pulse wave and add stimulations in both cortical and subcortical areas. We select minimal strenuous from two to six milliampere. That neuronal dysfunction is uh, reproducibly induced. Selection of interoperative tasks are as following. In left hemisphere, language task is absolutely necessary. On the other hand, in right hemisphere, uh, visual spatial cognition, social cognitive function, and spatial working memory uh, should be considered. Basic level function, such as speech, motor, somatosensory, visual field, and attentional network should be evaluated in both hemispheres. This slide shows relationships between white matter fibers and interoperative tasks, which are appropriated uh, for detection of those positive induced symptoms. It is essential to establish tasks with one-to-one -one correspondence between task and symptom. Among them, I'm going to show detail in five higher brain functions, uh, such as language, visual spatial cognition, social cognitive function, spatial working memory, and attentional function. From the next section, I'll speak about details of how to evaluate these higher brain functions. Language is a fundamental and essential function which can be classified into two subcategories, uh, such as phonological and verbal semantic networks. We often use picture naming tasks and sometimes semantic tasks represented by PPTT, which was reported in 2004. Uh, the induced symptoms are anomia, phonemic paraphasia, associated with dorsal language pathway, and the semantic paraphasia associated with ventral language pathway. The 
The second is special working memory, which is one of the exec, uh, executive function. Uh, active short-term memory is necessary for processing of working memory, and it affects the quality of life. This two-back test is used for examination for the function. Uh, in front of a patient, six images of two-back test appeared in the monitor. When the patient's image is the same uh, with two images before, patients should respond as answer yes. Or when different image and the answer of no. This is correct answer. I'm going to show an interoperative video of two back task. You can watch videos. Uh, in the first two slides, the patient is ordered to memorize special information. And then from the next two slides, she has to memorize and uh, answer simultaneously with bottom press action during simulation. As shown in the video, she mistook in all slides from the third. Our research using trustography and BBM analysis uh, suggested that chronic special working memory deficit was associated with damage of medial frontal parietal network. Uh, next, uh, visual spatial cognition is a function to direct attention to bilateral visual spaces and the severe disorder is left hemispatial neglect. The representative network is known as right superior longitudinal fascicle two. Excuse me. Uh, also, during our condition in surgery, line bisection task, you know, is a simple and useful examination for judgment for visual spatial disturbances. In this patient, after rejection of right frontal tumor, line bisection task was negative in control. This is control. The center line is, uh, is mid line. And next, uh, stimulating in the posterior wall of rejection cavity. You can see the center line deviated to right direction. In BBM analysis, uh, these areas were located on the superior longitudinal fascicle and the damage of the fascicle uh, could cause the persistent visual spatial dysfunction. A social cognitive function is necessary for social communication and it is a skill to comprehend about social event and relationship with own and other person. Mentalizing is one of the representative functions and classified in uh, low level and high level categories. Eyes based emotion task is sensitive in the evaluation for low level mentalizing during our surgery. And we show eight patterns of eye pictures which express different emotions. In the Research collaborated with Dr. Elbert group in Montpellier, France. Uh, it was suggested that right arcade fascicle has a crucial role in face-based mentalizing network. Uh, on the other hand, high-level mentalizing uh, is a skill to read other person's mind from its action, circumstances, and intervention of another person. In the first slide, uh, a man has a back, and in the next, he left the back and goes to take a flower. In the third slide, another person runs away with his back. When the back changes to the dog, uh, in the last slide, 
how do you think this man plays in the fourth slide? The patient asked to answer to the question. In this case, with right frontal tumor, a negative response was confirmed in control. This is control. Answer is correct. But during simulation, the those lateral prefrontal cortex, she couldn't respond the correct answer. She should silent. And she uh, explained that she couldn't understand the story. Our study indicated that assessment of high level mentalizing during operation was useful to preserve the associated network such as a superior longitudinal fascicle and frontostilator tract. Attention is function which forms the basis of all higher brain functions. We have to avoid the disorder caused in the early step of our surgery. Attention rated region is widely spread into lateral area of hemispheres. However, the connectivity converged in deep layer near the cingulate tract. This strip task, uh, which asks the color of Chinese character, meaning its color, uh, is useful and sensitive also in the way condition during the operation. In the next slide, I'm going to show a representative case with recurrence of right frontal anaplastic astrocytoma, uh, which was successfully rejected by our surgery. Uh, this patient is right-handed tumor, a social worker. Uh, to acquire maximal safe rejection, we selected uh, interoperative task such as motor task for negative motor network and the speech task for frontal Aslan track, visual special cognition task for SLF super longitudinal fascicle two, and social cognitive function, uh, the task for associated with posterior frontal region. A two back task for special working memory and the last is a strip task for uh, attentional network of single tract. Uh, Pre-operative 3D tractography showed some white matter tract uh, adjacent to the tumor. And then uh, critical mapping uh, we perform and it reproduced um, policy mapping such as uh, social cognition and negative motor network on the posterior frontal area. This is a final picture uh, after the rejection with errors in special two back task. Uh, two-back task in the major frontal lobe and errors in strip task in deep cingulate region. And then these area were preserved. Uh, Post-operative MRI showed in large rejection of hyperlegia, that is a uh, super total rejection with preservation of higher brain function in the right frontal lobe. Okay, uh, let me move on to the second section, uh, clinical research. Uh, in the past section, I've mentioned about intraoperative identification of neuronal networks of higher brain functions uh, to investigate the technical contributions for the patient with glioma in right frontal lobe, non-dominant hemisphere, 
uh, we evaluated the postural functional outcome using VBM analysis, uh, especially in visual spatial cognition and spatial working memory. In the results, uh, each functional network was associated with dorsal superior longitudinal fascicle and singular tract. Uh, it was suggested by VBM and interoperative brain mapping. In the patient's group with mapping, both maximal resection and preservation of these functions uh, could be performed. The most critical region was detected in deep white matter area of right frontal lobe. Using uh, higher brain mapping, we can preserve these critical areas. Uh, here, there is a question that uh, does awake craniotomy preserving QA and higher brain functions improve the surgical outcome also in glioblastoma? And glioblastoma is the most malignant WH grading four tumor and mean overall survival is about one and a, and a half year. Uh, focusing on glioblastoma and QOL, our study suggested that uh, our craniotomy could preserve post-operative in independence level, um, but dependent on age and preoperative condition. Critical area, including white matter fascicles, uh, shown in the picture were extracted by BVM analysis. On the other hand, our recent surgical strategy with our craniotomy could improve surprisingly uh, not only functional outcome, but also overall survival uh, compared with historical control. Mean three year survival rate was approximately 50%. Uh, this study is ongoing now. Using our higher brain functional mapping, we have challenged challenge to uh, well unknown neural networks such as the superior front occipital fascicle. This white matter pathway was discovered in the monkey brain. However, the function and also existence in human uh, are controversial. This study consists of three approaches, interoperative mapping, VVM neuroimaging and DTI tractography and fiber dissection. With the three dimensional spatial data of 450 policy mapping points in our department, uh, we performed the anatomical functional analysis about the white matter pathway. Uh, it is concluded that the superior front occipital fasco would not ex would not exist in human brain. This is a negative result, um, but essential evidence uh, which will open new door to the future researches. I'll conclude my presentation. Uh, our challenge to our craniotomy for cerebral glioma with mapping of higher brain function and could contribute to both uh, clinical functional outcome and survival outcome, and also the brain functional science. Uh, this is the last slide. Uh, for the development of neurofunctional research, we are we are collaborating with international researchers in France and Russia. Uh, we, we illustrated the function of a Nobel white matter fascicle front Aslan tract with Dr. Dufo and his uh, colleagues. Now we have started international joint research program regarding uh, neuronal 
networks of understanding other persons. Uh, especially this year, a PhD student from your country, Russia, uh, would have come to Japan, but uh, you know, uh, novel coronavirus pandemic uh, disturbed the starting. Um, we really pray the end of the crisis as soon as possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kinoshita. Uh, I'm always excited when I see our awake surgery. And uh, I hope uh, the student from Russia joined your uh, laboratory as soon as possible. So I take questions from audience. Okay, then I make first question. So, uh, so I, I thought, uh, uh, depending on the response from patients, you may uh, improve, uh, the, it, due to the awake surgery, you may improve quality of life. But I thought it may affect survival, but you nicely demonstrated it also improved survival. And uh, my question is, uh, why this happens? So, this is because you can appropriately dissect tumors or, or you improve the quality of life and this made a longer survival and uh, both of them, what you uh, thought. Uh, thank you for an uh, important question. Uh, the both um, functional outcome and survival outcome uh, are important to uh, keep same, same good levels. Uh, our goal is to uh, perform um, maximum rejection and, and preservation of QOL. So the, uh, in, in general anesthesia, uh, we cannot uh, evaluated this higher brain function. So this now uh, in the present era, the uh, awake mapping is the only method to, uh, to uh, perform the uh, preservation of both. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you for the um, very interesting presentation. Now I have no questions. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, no more questions. Yeah, take from a uh, lesson from here is very careful. Our uh, surgery saves uh, this is total life of the patients. Mm. So I uh, appreciate this uh, presentation, Dr. Kinoshita. And if no more question, okay, Tajubu Yosuka. Then I will move to uh, the last speaker. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kinoshita. <clears throat> thank you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd like to introduce the last speaker, uh, this Dr. Uh, Roman Aseri Berstov. Mm. Uh, my correcting <laughs> pronunciation. Uh, his title for this session is Modern Clinical and Laboratory Criteria for the Diagnosis and Prognosis of the Course of uh, Cerebral Glial Tumors. So, uh, Dr. Seriber Stoff, please start your presentation. Um, uh, 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 unfortunately, uh, excuse me, unfortunately, uh, the Dr. Seriber Stoff uh, now has a um, surgical operation. And oh, okay. I, I will introduce, uh, I will uh, show your presentation uh, by video, and uh, if possible, I can uh, give the, some uh, comment, comments uh, to this one. Okay, that's fine, yeah. And one so moment, the, please, I, I should yeah. preparing this one. Okay, he's busy. And, um, this is uh, our colleagues uh, from uh, surgical department of the 
uh, um, uh, Human Brain Institute, and uh, we are uh, working together. And I will show uh, I will show your presentation. Then. Вот это черное окно выбивает, я даже не знаю, как из него выйти. Ну, вы выйдете опять из э, демонстрации, еще раз зайдите, только не забудьте нажать на то, что вы хотите показывать. Ага, сейчас, угу. сейчас я секундочку постараюсь это сделать. One moment. Вот, смотрите. Так. так, а вы нам не присылали, мы не, не сможем помочь. Это, 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 это у меня, да, у меня, угу. я просто... У меня просто видны докладчики, а я не знаю, как из этого выйти. Вот у меня... Ага, вот вижу, вижу, вижу. Так, вот я нажимаю на демонстрацию экрана. И... Теперь нужно выбрать, что вы хотите демонстрировать. Вот я шлю... На рабочем столе у вас есть же? Да, 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 она у меня запутана. Вот. Нет, мы... Так. Теперь нажмите синюю кнопку демонстрации в правом нижнем углу. Вот это видно что-нибудь сейчас? Сейчас видно, нет? Нет, не видно. Так, я уже... Так, что-то, что, что я не так... Так, выберите... Сейчас, сейчас, секунду. Так, это я сейчас убираю все лишнее. Так. Себя я вижу. Так, вот у меня сейчас черное, черное окно со всеми докладчиками. А как мне из него выйти, чтобы пока сделать? Татьяна Борисовна, помогите мне. А, вот вижу, вижу, там что-то наверху такое. Да, утвердить. Так. так, вот новая демонстрация наверху. Так. Давайте поступательно нажимаем еще раз зеленую кнопку демонстрации экрана. Выбираем тот доклад, экрана, да. вот тот доклад меня... который вы хотите выбрать. После чего вы нажали на него один раз так. и синяя кнопка демонстрации а, экрана. А у меня только совместное использование. Это оно? <кхм> да, оно. Так. Теперь что-то изменилось? Видно, Пока что? нет. Как-то хорошо запускалось так раньше. Так. так. Может, вы нам быстренько по почте пошлете, мы сами запустим. А, да, давайте, давайте я сейчас так и сделаю. Вы пока народ поразвлекайте, а мы две минуты возьмем. Все, 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 сейчас. Я... Угу. Так, сейчас. Uh, dear Sherman, uh, I, I'm asked to a couple of minutes for the technical problem. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. we, we we shall have some break. Five minutes. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. We uh, we have five minutes break from now. Yeah. Until the uh, video is ready. Так, 
ਕਿ ਵੈਕਸੀਨ ਤੋਂ ਪੂਰੀ ਸਰੀਰ ਚੱਲਦੀ ਹੈ Татьяна Борисовна, я отправил вам файл, встречайте. Да, я увидела, все, сейчас запустим. Угу. Значит, Татьяна Борисовна, там э, у него видео и аудио, вернее, аудиосопровождение, э, но я буду какие-то комментарии давать, поэтому я буду говорить, когда переснуть. Хорошо на меня? Хорошо, это? хорошо. Угу, угу. Михаил Ильич, сейчас запустим. Хорошо, Загрузилось. Угу. Угу. Готово. А, только можно? А, да, полный экран. Ага. Угу. Хорошо. Так, а он что-то не, не говорит ничего. А, Татьяна Борисовна, а, а его звук будет слышен, не знаете? Can send me right. Ага, все понятно. сначала я объявлю, Dear Jackie, we are ready. Oh, okay, we are ready. Yes, yes, we are ready and beginning uh, the presentation of my colleagues, uh, Roman Selvorsov, please, uh, with my comments, of course. Yeah, okay, so let's uh, restart the uh, session. So uh, it's uh, the uh, talk by uh, Roman is starting right now. Okay, please start. MicroRNA expression in the complex treatment of glial cerebral tumors, a case from practice methods. Positron emission tomograph, contrast enhanced MRI, international standards for the treatment of glial tumors, the protocol for assessing the next expression levels of microRNA using polymerase chain reaction. The next picture, please. the algorithm of permission of laboratory findings. The reference values of mRNA expressions were refined using potentially helpful volunteers. 50. An algorithm for interpreting the results of microRNA studies was developed. 50. Clinical observation of patients at various stage of glioma treatment. The next slide, please. Uh, um, okay. Case report. Uh, no, no, uh, pre uh, pre uh, here you can see the uh, name, uh, names of microRNA which we uh, investigated and um, uh, he uh, here you can see the clinical um, uh, detection, uh, data with this microRNA connections, the prognosis, stabilization and uh, stable uh, stabilization mean probably uh, low uh, probably of the progress. This is uh, uh, our clinical uh, data which um, connect with microRNA and clinical data. Uh, slide, please. Case report. Patient 
55 years old with a volumetric pathological process in the right shifted and parietal lobes, bone plastic craniotomy, microsurgical total removal of a tumor with interoperative neuronavigation, neurophysiological monitoring, direct stimulation of the corticospinal tract at all stages of the tumor removal, histological immunohistochemical molecular genetic research, and a bare banking of the tumor were performed. The next I picture, please. Results of micro expression in blood and saliva before operation. The metabolic activity, the reproliferative capacity, and vaginas were high. It was an active tumor. Uh, the next picture, please. Uh, no, no, uh, uh, I, I want to uh, comment. If you can see there in the saliva, you can see there. Um, uh, critical uh, levels of the uh, Oncomir 21 and uh, 210 is higher, higher than normal and uh, microRNA 128 in plasma cells have the, uh, the same uh, unnormal uh, uh, level. Uh, I, I want to underline that before operation it's clinical prognosis active tumor. Here we can see MRI control of the brain with contrast enhancement. On the first day after surgery, totally removed tumor. We can see at the second picture. The next slide, please. According to the histological and immunohistochemical conclusion, after World Health Organization classification, it was lysacome grade 4 in aplasia. One mutation in the PTN gene of the missense type was detected. No other changes are detected, including in the IDH1 and IDH2 genes, including profile of chromosomes. The presence of mutation in the PTN gene, the absence of the change in the IDH1, IDH2 genes, the absence of MGMT modification and high tumor activity according to microRNA expression data indicated the likely absence of a significant effect of radiation and chemotherapy. The the next picture. Here we can see expression mRNA in fragments of removed neoplasm. The metabolic activity of the tumor is high the proliferative capacity is high and business is high. It was an active tumor. Um, some, comment, uh, uh, some comment, some uh, comment, if you can see in the uh, tissue of the tumor, you have, you, we have seen the very uh, big level, very high level of the expression, the proto-oncogen uh, micro, uh, proto uh, microRNA. When comparing preparative and postoperative data, a positive dynamic of microRNA expression in blood plasma and saliva was noted, confirmed that the tumor tissue was maximally removed. The tumor activity is low, the proliferative capacity is medium, and business is higher. After the operation, the patient uh, was uh, I want to underline that uh, after the uh, operating, um, we have uh, um, uh, decreasing the uh, level of the uh, um, microRNA 21 and 20, uh, 210 uh, in the saliva. Uh -huh. uh, then, see the slide, After the operation, the patient was underwent a course of radiation therapy up to total radiation dose 60 gray, synchronously with the reception of tenzolamide, without complication from the hematopoietic system. MicroRNA expression in blood and saliva showed that the tumor activity is higher, the proliferative capacity is higher, and business is higher. The clinical prognosis is negative. Uh, небольшие uh, some comments. Uh, 
this is a follow up to, uh, follow up investigation uh, after the operation after the uh, therapy and you have seen that uh, levels of, of the uh, oncomir 21 and 210 uh, uh, was elevated is um, comparing the uh, negative prognosis here we can see negative dynamics of microRNA expression confirmed by neuroimaging and positron emission tomography data. By the PET, we can see increased metabolic activity of the tumor component. On MRI, growth of the thighs of the neoplasm in the right parietal shifted temporal lobes and the corpus callosum were there. The next slide, please. Here you can see the parallel dynamic and the parallel negative dynamic in the uh, clinics and microRNA uh, dynamics. Uh, Summary of case of frame practice. The results of the expert diagnosis with accompanying molecular genetic studies indicated a low sensitivity of the neoplasm to radiation and chemotherapy retreatment. MicroRNA values in blood and saliva correlated with its expression in tumor tissue and the result of the mRNA study at various stage of the patient's treatment adequately and reliably reflected the cause of the disease. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, this is a short communication of our uh, colleagues from the surgical department. I reflect the uh, relationship between uh, relationship between uh, clinical data you're using uh, receiving using the MRI and uh, other clinical um, methods uh, with uh, dynamics of the expression of microRNA especially for the uh, oncomir uh, microRNA, I mean microRNA 21 and 210, uh, and uh, therefore this microRNA can, uh, is available uh, to using uh, the, uh, not only prognostic factors, but uh, also the, um, for the monitoring of the effectiveness of operating, uh, um, in, uh, uh, surgical uh, operating, and uh, follow up prognosis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, is there a comment? No, that's not right. Pro Professor Zalaiski, so you are collaborating with him, right? So, you are very familiar with his data. You know very well about his data, right? Uh, uh, so, so his data shows only microRNA, not protein, not targets. So do you know the uh, target protein and linking to the microRNA in his, in his data? Do you know that? Um, the the, tar the target uh, gene for the microRNA is much more, uh, and we don't know uh, how uh, how my, uh, how um, uh, which my, uh, which mRNA of which genes uh, um, um, activated in the glioma cells. It's uh, um, it's very difficult, uh, at least at at, at present. Uh, but uh, we have a show there. Uh, the connection, the relationship uh, for the uh, using this microRNA as a markers of the um, negativity prognosis of myoglioma. Not only, um, maybe in the other uh, step of our investigation, we, we, we used um, investigated some gene, but in my uh, previous uh, uh, report, I showed that. Uh, we have as uh, we have a relationship between between expression of the some some gene, but uh, it should be confirmed in the future investigation. Thank okay, you. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a technical question. So, uh, microRNAs are uh, very rich in exosomes. Yeah. 
Mm. So technically, you are measuring a microRNA in exosome or total plasma? No, no, so no. We we, uh, uh, we uh, extract the total RNA from plasma and saliva. Okay. After the centrifugation, for the removing the uh, cells and subcells uh, um, substance. Mm. So uh, you are detecting microRNA in saliva and plasma, and uh, uh, that's. So microRNA are produced by gliomas, and uh, uh, so there's any barrier like a BBB barrier that prevents microRNA to be exploded, and uh, or glioblastoma totally destroyed it, so they can freely go into plasma. Uh, uh, you mean uh, mm, what is the way of <laughs> for microRNA from plasma uh, mm. from cells or? Um, um, maybe maybe repeat this. Yeah, so uh, we have a source of microRNA. So it's tumor or, yeah, because there is, a, I, I believe a, there is a blood uh, brain barrier. Ah. Mm. Mm. But uh, maybe uh, because of the tumor, uh, microRNA go across this barrier. <clears throat> mm. Am I correct? <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, it's um, uh, uh, if uh, uh, the, the way um, uh, which uh, microRNA uh, inside the exosome uh, go to the plasma from the uh, glioma is understanding because exosome uh, probably can uh, go through the uh, this barrier, and we have uh, seen this. Mm, uh, this situation, uh, for example, uh, before operating and after operating, uh, during this operating, you know that we have uh, destroyed these barriers. Um, but uh, the question uh, uh, more difficult, uh, why this microRNA uh, working in the saliva? Mm. Uh, mm. It's, a, it's a very difficult question because saliva it's not filtrate uh, like plasma or like urine, for example. Yes, the uh, saliva is a secret uh, of the um, cells, uh, not for, not uh, not glioma, but uh, saliva glands. So this is a very big uh, question. However, we have seen this uh, the same situation. Uh, in the other uh, other um, um, cancer, for example, the colorectal cancer uh, in saliva, we have uh, detected the significant uh, uh, significant levels of for, for the clinic or microRNA. Um, uh, probably, probably is our it's our preliminary hypothesis that during the um, cancer um, uh, cancer reprogramming the um, the all uh, cells of our uh, of organism of patient um, um, switch uh, switch it uh, on the other um, uh, control is some metabolism uh, but uh, only in the one tissue for example the nervous tissue is a uh, uh, creates uh, the focus of um, of cancer mm -hmm. but uh, I, I want to underline that uh, it's uh, not so clear until now mm -hmm. thank you very much <clears throat> any other question from audience okay uh, so if not thank you very much mm. So I would like to close this session. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for speakers and the audience. Now I'd like to wrap up this session. The first two speakers mentioned genetic and metabolic aspects, brain tumor, and latter two are referred to clinical and um, diagnostic. And I strongly believe this information provided all speakers with significantly contribute to uh, our advance and mutual interaction between Russia and Japan in medical sciences and also uh, many fields. Uh, finally, I would like to great thank to Mikhail Zalaisky. <laughs> he greatly contributed to the organization of uh, running the whole symposium. Uh, so, uh, Mikhail, do you have any comments about on it? A uh, couple of words. Uh, I, I'm, I'm... Um, um, I'm also 
uh, want to say thank you very much uh, to uh, colleagues uh, from Japan, from the University of Kanazawa, Kyoto, and um, um, our um, participant and uh, participant of this symposium. And I hope uh, that uh, this symposium will be uh, the very good um, tradition, uh, mm -hmm. probably tradition uh, and very um, useful uh, tools for the investigation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So someday finishing COVID and we will meet directly again in Russia with Japan. Okay. <laughs> okay, Bye. thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye-bye now. Bye, thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.